Jennifer Egan is here. She was just 26 when her first story was published in The New Yorker. Her first novel, The Invisible Circus, was a critical and popular success. Her most recent work, Look at Me, secured her a National Book Award nomination for fiction. The New Yorker described it as, quote, a stunningly written exploration of the American obsession with self-invention. I am pleased to have Jennifer Egan at this table for the very first time. Welcome. Thank you. Um, this is getting a lot of very, 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 very good att attention. And I wouldn't ask something silly like, are you surprised? But, but the level of it. Um, I'm surprised because it was published at what turned out to be such a bad time. I mean, yeah. it came out a week after September 11th, and things looked pretty grim at first. So yeah. I had basically resigned myself to the fact that, you know, the book I, wrote, I spent six years writing might never really get much attention at all. So it was a strange turnaround in mid-publication, and I owe it almost completely to the National Book Award nomination. So all of a sudden, there was a re-, a re it gave the book some kind of life. Again. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think a lot of people, a lot of writers, have really struggled this fall because it was just hard to get any kind of media attention, and this gave you know gave me a way to to get the book out there. Mm. So I'm I am surprised because you know it was in midstream things really changed, and that was that was pretty thrilling. When did you decide you wanted to write fiction? Uh, I think I decided consciously when I was about 18. I mean, looking back, I can find the seeds of it much earlier, but I was obsessed with this idea of becoming an archaeologist for a long time. And it wasn't until I took a year off between high school and college and actually went on a small archaeological dig in Campsville, Illinois, which I paid to go on, that I realized that my notions of archaeology were unrealistic. I mean, I'd pictured digging out big urns and, um, you know, ha having this fairly glamorous international existence. Yeah, right. And in fact, I was sitting on a square meter of earth with a scalpel in 99 degree heat and I thought I don't know this isn't quite what I imagined so I think after that I um I actually did other things I traveled by myself in Europe and uh and I think being separate from everything I knew really at such a young age forced me to look at what what really mattered to me and and uh and I realized that fiction was really what held the world together for me writing fiction and so I got to college knowing exactly what I wanted to do unfortunately I picked my college based on its archaeology program <laughs> and I was enrolled in that so it, you know it made for a few logistical problems but it was it was no big deal and so you added up on literature courses and things like that or not um, yes, very much so. Yeah, I mean, but I was very eclectic. I mean, it was I was an undergraduate, and I, I I went in all different areas, and I did do actually some fiction writing. One story in my short story collection, Emerald City, is um, a, a much edited version of something I wrote in college. Which was what, about what? It's called Letter to Josephine, and it's about a woman um, who goes to uh, with her husband to Bora Bora in Tahiti and becomes fixated on this other younger woman whose life she begins to have all kinds of fantasies about, yeah. and then later um, sees that woman, whom she had imagined as very glamorous and sort of exotic, um, sees her working basically as a waitress. Uh, so it was very much about about the um, about the way that fantasy life can kind of take over in liminal circumstances or at times when we're removed from the the ordinary rules of life and and travel is one of those times. The in the, the first magazine article was about what? You mean the article for the New York New Times York, magazine? Right. Yeah, um, it was. It was. It was the New Yorker, oh, the New York Times magazine. Oh no. Okay, you meant the, the first short story yeah. I published um, was yes in the New Yorker when I was 26, mm. and that was um, that was called the Stylist, and it took place in in Africa on the island of Lamu. And it was Coming about, out of your travels? Um, to some degree. I had been there, yes. Yeah. I mean, very briefly. Uh, but um, it was about a fashion shoot taking place there and, um, and a, about a relationship between a stylist and a photographer. And, and then the New York, New York Times magazine article was what? The, the New York, first New York Times magazine article, oddly enough, also involved the fashion industry. It, probably the only two things I've written up until this book that involved that. Um, and that was about a young model named James King, who was 16 at the time that I wrote the story, and she's now an actress. Um, she was in Pearl Harbor and other films. Yeah. Um, but I was really looking at the phenomenon of young girls living as adults, um, sometimes with one or even no years of high school under their belt in New York, working as fashion models. And, and I was looking and at what that life is about and what it does to you. And, and that particular cultural moment of 1996 when to a degree that I think has lessened now the world at least within America the popular culture was very interested in and concerned with the the modeling industry and so the Times was inter interested in capturing that moment culturally and that's what I tried to do the invisible circus the Invisible Circus is, a, is totally different. It's about, uh, it takes place in the 70s, and it's about a girl um, named Phoebe O'Connor who is 18 and whose older sister has committed suicide at the end of the 60s. And she's haunted by that era and some sense of having missed 
this this important time and and being dwarfed by her sister's life and so she ends up essentially running away from home with a bunch of postcards her sister had been sending from Europe and following in her steps trying to figure out what happened to her. In fact, the itinerary she follows is the is my own itinerary from those travels right, I right. took during my year off when I was in Europe. This book, the the what came first for you, the idea of a model of a, a model who is reaching some years and and uh, and this relationship with a younger woman in her hometown or was it the character was it the idea of the relationship what I think I had an interest in exploring image culture and, and certain tensions and pressures that I saw at work in America so that was the very abstract idea um, for some reason what I always begin with when I'm writing fiction is a sense of place and that really predates characters, storyline, anything else. And the place in this case was Rockford, Illinois, strangely enough. But not really strangely, because my mother's from there. And I, I had been going there since I was a child. And I became fascinated by certain memories I had of it, not really personal memories, but more a sense of industrial decline that really permeates that. It's, it's, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's a kind of classic, smaller American city that has really struggled since um, industry began moving overseas. And so after my grandparents had both passed away, I found myself longing to go back there for reasons I couldn't understand and my mother really couldn't understand. Um, but I would go and... Just and to visit and to soak up the culture. To soak up the, the culture the such as it is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very American city in the sense that the downtown is, is very anemic. I mean, very little exists at this point and commerce has moved out into the, to malls, you know, in the middle of cornfields. And there's, there's, very, there's a lack of a center. Um, but that's precisely what interested me. So yeah, I would rent a car and kind of drive around and lie around in my motel at night watching Unsolved Mysteries, which actually figures in the book to some degree, that TV uh, show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but here, is, here, the idea of starting with place is interesting. I think my memory fades on this, but I think someone like, maybe him, John Updike said, I always start with place. Oh, that's interesting. You know, but someone else has told me that because my I would assume that that novelist would start with a a story or a character would be the thing that motivates them to tell a story about you know but but place and in your case also an idea to explore a theme mm -hmm. Well, that, I mean, that is always, that can't be too much in the foreground because then why not just write an essay? Right, I mean, exactly. it's, but there are certain intellectual or philosophical queries that I have playing around in my mind as a kind of background noise. And then meanwhile, I have something very different, which is this strong kind of almost a gut feeling of an atmosphere or a place where I, I want to be mentally. That doesn't mean it's a place where I want to be physically necessarily. Yeah. And in the case of Rockford, again, you know, it's not that it's some kind of fascinating place necessarily, except for what it represents and the ways in which I guess in my mind that um, it dovetailed with certain of the intellectual queries that I had. But in any case, as I was driving around there, then characters began to come to me and I would say that's the next step for me is that I have a sense of people and I really need to hear them. I need to have a sense of how they would speak before I really feel that, that they exist enough for me to write about Stimulated them. Stimulated by somebody you meet or? No, not at all. In fact, the, the, the further from my own experience the characters seem to be, the better. I'm, I'm very bad and in fact would like to improve at being able to write about people I know or even my own life, which I, I write about very poorly. So I need to feel that there's almost no overlap between my fictional world and my actual now, life. How did you know you write about your own life poorly? Bitter experience. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm really, the, the personal essay, the, the memoir, all these forms yeah. that are so popular But you don't, put incident, you don't put things into your fiction that happen to you in a way that it gives you a chance to a little be bit, cathartic a little or bit. something? No, I do. For example, in the case of that story I mentioned, Letter yeah. to Josephine, that short story that I wrote in college, I myself had had an experience of seeing someone that I had had all kinds of, of um, glamorous imaginings about, and then later, uh, uh, you know, years later, a couple of years later, encountered her working as a waitress, which was which was quite strange. So yes, I do take personal incidents and put them in, but but really important aspects of my life do not find their way in, except in a kind of coded form that I can't even crack because. The truth is, if I feel that I'm writing about myself, it doesn't interest me. And you, you mentioned believing that, that writers must begin with the story, and I can see why you would think that. I mean, I tend to think that too, except that if I know the story, I'm not interested in writing it, because for me, the process is really one of discovery. And so I, the feeling of writing is not that dissimilar. So you have no idea where, when you started writing this, and when, once you discovered at least some of your characters, 
and you knew the locale, Rockford and New York, mm -hmm. you had no idea what was going to unfold. I had some vague idea. I mean, I think it's a little bit dr of like driving. I can see, you know, I can see what's ahead of me on the road, but that's very little mm -hmm. of the ultimate destination. Or you know what direction you're going, but you know what road you're going to take. Exactly. I mean, I and I and I think if I if I can see my way, I mean, when people tell me they read the last page of a book first, I just I can't even imagine doing that. I mean, I'm very childlike in the sense that I, you know, I, I, whether I'm reading, you know, King Lear or you know, Agatha Christie, which I loved as a kid, not knowing the end is crucial for me as a reader and as a writer to some degree also. But interestingly, what I do begin to have a sense of as I move through the narrative is where the ending will occur. Again, place is, is the beginning. Mm. In the case of Look at Me, it was a, it was a pretty scary feeling not to know where the story would go because it's a very complicated story sure with, with many strands. With lots of characters. I want to talk about a few of them. What character came to you first? I think, uh, I think Probably the model, uh, which but oddly enough, yes, who has the has this catastrophic mm -hmm. car accident and whose face is is essentially destroyed. A person who's made her life as a selling her image. Her, her image. She's a, she's a sort of middling fashion model. And she comes back to New York, and nobody really. Exactly, but she came out of Rockford in the sense that I was. I, I was driving to Rockford in, in one of these rented cars a, in a huge um, rainstorm and I suddenly had this notion of the car spinning off the road and someone destroying her face and, um, and that, was, that was the first, that was the linchpin of the story. I, I knew that she was from Rockford and I, I had a sense that this was going to be about the confluence of these two worlds, Rockford and, and New York. And, uh, and that she would be the person who was connected to both worlds. So once I had her, then other kind of murmurings that I had been having while in Rockford made more sense to me. I knew there was kind of a mad history professor right. who was obsessed with the Industrial Revolution. Right, right. Uh, I had a sense that there was some young ingenue in there. And I also knew right from the beginning that I had a chameleon character, someone who had taken on multiple identities and someone whose past we don't really know as the book is unfolding. Right. So they, they came to me sort of slowly. But the principal character is the one that she has a kind of, uh, the relationship with, the, the, the young woman, would you say? Yeah, you mean the, the uh, younger girl? Yeah, exactly. Yes, I, and, and she came to me fairly early too. I mean, she, I knew that, as I say, that there was a young, sort of an ingenue, someone who's, whose life wasn't clear to her yet, a teenager. But she's very different from Charlotte. Yes, she is quite different. Um, but and I, I had some sense that that their that their contact would be glancing but meaningful, and that they mm. would meet again at the end of the book. But again, I had no idea where or how. Why are they attracted to each other? Well, I think that in a certain sense, there's a certain kind of directness that they both have, uh, and a, and a, and a in a way an inability to well an inability to dissemble effectively. So they they have a sort of cha a chance encounter in which they both speak very frankly, and then and then part ways and, and both presume that they'll never see the other again. Uh, so, but, but I, so I, I mean, I think that they're, that's really the thing they have in common and then many things separate them also. They do have a connection in that the younger Charlotte is the daughter right, of right. the elder Charlotte's best friend from high school right, and right. we don't know, may have been named after her. You also have a terrorist, Z. You know, did, what, after September 11th, what went through your mind? Not, two things. First of all, go ahead. Tell well, me I was. I felt. Uh, I felt quite shocked by certain parallels between the the man I had invented and some of the people who had had perpetrated the bombings of September 11th. And what I found especially eerie was that I mean I had done a fair amount of research on my character and had spoken to some people who had worked in the FBI and counterterrorism and had been led to believe that the classic ter suicide bomber profile was someone very young and inexperienced without much to lose, kind of a, a, sim a simple zealot. And I knew that that was not going to work for me, that, that, that someone like that couldn't, couldn't carry through the trajectory that I wanted my character to carry through. So I decided to depart from that in certain ways and make him a little bit older, better educated, mm -hmm. someone who came to radicalism a little later in life. And, uh, and, and so it was very eerie to find that some of these, yeah, these men departed from the model right, in the that's same right. way. That, exactly. You said it well. I mean, that's exactly what's surprising about these terrorists. It didn't, they didn't fit the profile. You know, they were adult. They were, had families. They were not 18-year-olds, for the most part, who, who seemed to have been lost and impressionable. And, and somebody could easily you know, take them on some exactly. journey, promising them some return that they didn't Sophisticated, imagine. in other yeah. words. Exactly, yes. So that was, that was very strange. Um, it's not the first time that I've, I've had that sense of, 
uh, the, of you know being pressing. reality well or just or even just reading things and then finding them finding reality echoing them not necessarily always you know being the the, the source of the prescience right. I mean I think the truth is that you know I was I was consciously trying to find the tensions and the pressures that I saw at work on America in the late 20th century and project out from those to imagine what the future would be like. I mean, it, the novel was intended to be slightly futuristic, although right. it doesn't, doesn't really, I don't think it will end up reading that way. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I think terrorism was one of those pressures, and I think, I think we all knew that in some sense. And so that's, that's what I was writing about. I mean, the, in a way, there's, there's no mystery about it. It's just the timing that's so strange. Mm -hmm. uh, to have the book come out right as that was happening. You also reasonably prescient about reality-based entertainment. That was another strange thing. I mean, again, you know, it's I, I, you know, to, to some degree, reality-based entertainment is not a new thing. Not I mean, exactly, it's existed no. for quite right. a while, and, and even recently, um, MTV's Real World has existed throughout the 90s. But the phenomenal primetime success of things like Survivor. That was that was definitely a shock because I invent this this internet service in which people uh, basically allow their their actual lives to be packaged for public consumption and for um, movie research and and you know all kinds of um, all kinds of consumer uh, activities and uh, and I thought this was really satirical and kind of wild. In fact, I worried that it would be too far out. And so it was very strange to open up the newspaper one day and read that a show was coming to America about people being stranded on a desert island. I just thought, no, it, it, it can't be. Um, so it was strange. But again, you know, I, I was... I was listening carefully to the zeitgeist, very consciously, and clearly that was something that was coming along. I mean, what I often think is the le the lesson I've learned is if you're going to try to write about contemporary life, uh, do it very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> because right. yeah. It well, where do you find fast. the zeitgeist? Well, yeah, I mean, I just absorbing just, it from newspapers, magazines, movies, what people are talking about. I think just your gut. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's not. I, I don't go about it in a journalistic way at all. It's just just instinct. What's what seems interesting and relevant to me. Um, you know, you hope that you're tapping into the zeitgeist and that and that what you are imagining will will feel relevant at the time that it's published. Uh. You want people to come away from this, look at me, with some sense of an exploration of interesting characters, an entertained, a, a, a read that that was satisfying, entertaining, uh, took them on a journey that they were uh, that opened their mind to new ideas, all of those things. Sure. What else? What is it that what what is it you what? What's the most pleasant thing? What's the most satisfying thing that people have said who've read the book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, I think there's always some hope of, of impacting the way people think. And I find that as I'm, even in college when I would be writing essays about, you know, the the uh, imagery in Paradise Lost, I would have a sense of urgency about it, you know, right. that this was really an important point and, and it was, it was going to really change things when, when the word got out there about this thesis of mine. So I think that's something that, th that's in a way what makes writing so thrilling for me. There's a sense of urgency about it, a sense that somehow this really matters. You know, in the end, does it really? I don't know. But, you know, I've had, I've had people say things that, like, that, it, that, um, it had some impact on the way they saw celebrity culture, um, that it made them question certain things. I think that's, you know, that's always the hope, is that somehow the book ends up staying in people's minds and that they think of it, mm -hmm. you know, after. I mean, what you've talked about is, is wanting the read to be enjoyable, which, sure. of course, is, is very important. And as a reader, I value that very, very highly. But I think, ideally, of course, you want it to leave people with something more, something that lasts. And, yeah. That so makes them think, and makes very them, much so. and also in some way that touches their own experience, or somehow they think says something to them that that they have grappled with, or, or in a sense, or surprises them in a way that it puts things in a different perspective. Absolutely, it brings it brings some kind of light, either personally or outwardly, uh, to 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 one's life. Absolutely. I mean, that's always the hope. You know, my mother once said she had, she was, I, I had um, written something and she had said she had liked it and I was disappointed. And she said, well, what is it that you want? What is the reaction that you want? Right. What would be enough for you? Go, mom, go. And I thought about it and I, I said, 
I think I want to call from the emergency room <laughs> where someone has had to be hospitalized because yeah. the impact of my work was so enormous. I mean, I'm 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 being um, yeah. trivial, but but you know, there's the hope that it will that it will have some kind of effect on on the way people think. Absolutely. Is writing a book like this such a, an exhausting, demanding thing that you don't even think about? what you want to do next until it's sort of out there and, and on the bookstores and you have promoted it and, and you can then at some point find breathing time and to recharge your batteries and, and look again. I find that, that the next thing begins to kind of um, tingle uh, in my mind as I'm finishing the prior thing or one hopes that it will again because what I start with is so vague I mean just a sense of atmosphere or a sense of place it really is is sort of faint but I was I I had a, a sense of of this coming along in me as I was finishing the invisible circus and I have a sense of the next thing uh, now um, well, where are you do you have a place I have a place, and that's about it. Yeah, but any char one character. I have a place and a sense of some characters, uh, but it's it's you know it, the way I write can be frustrating and a little bit scary because I have to I have a obviously I'm in control of this on some level, but the way I experience it is that I am waiting for things to reveal themselves to me. So I have a sense of 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 this having to wait, and that's that can be frustrating. What's the joy for you of writing? I mean, writing something you have to do, but what's the satisfaction? I think the satisfaction is the sense of, of in some way, fusing thought and feeling and emotion uh, all at one time and, and creating a world that, that is so absorbing that it feels like it matters. I mean, that's, that's just a thrilling feeling to be... To be to create a world to create that exactly and to feel that it's working to feel that it matters is is uh, there's just no more thrilling feeling that I know I mean the converse unfortunately is that when it's not working it's it's Agony. really a dreary feeling I mean it's it's hard to be cheered up in any way when when years of work which you know are what it takes me to write a novel at times feel that they might be wasted or that I'm, I'm just going to fall short I'm not going to pull things together in a way that that will be satisfying and meaningful and that's it's terrifying Jennifer Egan look at me National Book Award finalist thank you thank you thank you for joining us see you next time when did you decide you wanted to write fiction uh, I think I decided consciously when I was about 18. I mean, looking back, I can find the seeds of it much earlier, but I was obsessed with this idea of becoming an archaeologist for a long time. And it wasn't until I took a year off between high school and college and actually went on a small archaeological dig in Campsville, Illinois, which I paid to go on, that I realized that my notions of archaeology were unrealistic. I mean, I'd picture digging out big urns and... Jennifer Egan is here. She was just 26 when her first story was published in The New Yorker. Her first novel, The Invisible Circus, was a critical and popular success. Her most recent work, Look at Me, secured her a National Book Award nomination for fiction. The New Yorker described it as, quote, a stunningly written exploration of the American obsession with self-invention. I am pleased to have Jennifer Egan at this table for the very first time. Welcome. Thank you. Um, this is getting a lot of very, 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 very good att attention. And I wouldn't ask something silly like, are you surprised? But, but the level of it. Um, I'm surprised because it was published at what turned out to be such a bad time. I mean, yeah. it came out a week after September 11th, and things looked pretty grim at first. So yeah. I had basically resigned myself to the fact that, you know, the book I, wrote, I spent six years writing might never really get, um, you know, having this fairly glamorous international existence. Yeah, right. And in fact, I was sitting on a square meter of earth with a scalpel in 99 degree heat, and I thought, I don't know, this isn't quite what I imagined. <laughs> so I think after that, I... Um, I actually did other things. I traveled by myself in Europe, and uh, and I think being separate from everything I knew really at such a young age forced me to look at what what really mattered to me and and uh, much attention at all. So it was a strange turnaround in mid publication, and I owe it almost completely to the National Book Award nomination. So all of a sudden, there was a re they a re it a gave re the book a, some a kind of life. Again. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think a lot of people, a lot of writers have really struggled this fall because it was just hard to get any kind of media attention. And this gave, you know, gave me a way to, to get the book out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I am surprised because, you know, it was in midstream, things really changed. And that was that was pretty thrilling. 